in my group, we're interested in, in how bacteria and plants uh, that live together, have lived together for millions of years, how they've evolved uh, ways to, to communicate and signal each other, both at the bacterial level, so how bacteria and bacterial signal with each other, because bacteria live in communities, so how do they signal with each other when they live near plants, and how is the plant signaling with the bacteria? So um, our world has been kind of revolutionized uh, approximately 15 years ago, that we now have to, we have to think of bacteria as uh, multicellular organisms or, or bacteria that like to live in communities. And what bacteria actually are doing, and we believe that most bacteria actually are doing, that they are producing uh, small uh, molecules that we call small signal molecules. And uh, so what we see here, we see it here like a solitary bacterium has a, a low concentration of the signal molecule, whereas this drastically changes when we have a community. And when we have a community, uh, the signal molecule that they produce increases in concentration. So what, what the bacterial community is able to do is able to sense the, the structure of this molecule and its concentration. And this gives them an incredible amount of information. It, it, gives, it tells them which bacteria is around them and how many of them are around them. And this, and this, uh, this mechanism is being termed, the, this mechanism is being coined as quorum sensing. Okay, it's obviously you, you understand quorum is a certain number of bacteria, a certain cell density. And what, and what scientists, what we have realized is that, that um, bacteria, when they are in, in solitary or when they're in low numbers, they're extremely vulnerable to all kinds of stresses out there, let it be biotic or abiotic, you know, when we have ho too hot or when we, when we lack water, um, they are very vulnerable, they die, uh, whereas communities are strong. Communities are strong, they, they are much more resistant to all kinds of uh, stresses and, and, and also are much more competitive. So you can appreciate that understanding this mechanism of, of communication and of coordination of synchrony in bacteria is a potential and very important target to control bacterial infections in humans and in plants and in other organisms as well. So uh, we think that it's, uh, it's, it's, it's got, if we understand this mechanism well, it's got tremendous applications in terms of control of bacterial communities. Here, just a slide to show you, I just go through, I don't want to go into the, the, the technical de details, is that this field is now, I, in my view, it's, it's really the tip of the iceberg. So we're finding all the time new languages of bacteria, so new molecules, uh, because you know, there are many species of bacteria out there, and, and so there are many languages out there. So uh, I think uh, you know, in the future we will, we, will, we will isolate more and more of these uh, signal molecules, more and more of these bacterial languages. And what I have done in my lab in the last 10 years or so is to focus very much on rice, for obvious reasons. We know that rice is the most important cereal crop in the world. Uh, and uh, so what we looked at, we looked at bacteria that are important that interact with rice. And I don't have time now to go through them, but we've, we've, we've spent several, several years looking at pathogens, you know, like a pathogen that causes grain rot or a very important pathogen in Asia uh, that causes a, a blight, bacterial blight. And also uh, another emerging pathogen that causes a sheath, sheath rot that is especially important if you grow rice up at certain high altitudes. But we've also looked at beneficial bacteria because obviously, just like in humans, in plants, there are many bacteria that live inside plants that are beneficial, that help the plant grow, help the plant acquire nutrients, produce hormones, plant hormones. So we're looking also at these important plants. Some of them are endophytes that live inside the plant, and some of them are, live, live uh, within, you know, in the close proximity to, to the roots. So we, we've asked ourselves, do these bacteria communicate? Is communication important? Could it be a way to, to either uh, you know, improve if in, in terms of beneficial bacteria or block in terms of pathogenic? And we have a lot of data and we show that in fact communication is crucial for all these interactions between bacteria and rice. But what, what I just do now in the next five minutes is just to give you some interesting examples, maybe some novel examples that we found. And in particular, I want to highlight today the, the Xanthomonas oryzae, very important pathogen. It's the second most important pathogen of, of rice after a fungus. And a beneficial pseudomonas in, in, in the rice tree. And what we discovered, to our big surprise, that these you know, opposing organism, a good guy and a bad guy, what they use, we've, we've, we've discovered a new way that they communicate with the plant. So what, what we, again, I, I keep the science, the science uh, details to a limit, but I'm very happy to discuss with any of you uh, the more scientific details. But what we discovered, we discovered a protein, of approximately 30 kilo Dalton, about 280 amino acids long, that has a, 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 at the end terminus a domain that binds a plant signal molecule. 
and that the C terminus has a DNA binding domain. That, that is just important for binding DNA. And what we discovered is that both the xanthomonas, the, the bad guy, and the pseudomonas, the good guy that lives near the roots, interact with the plant signal compounds. And this interaction then will allow uh, expression of the positive switching on and switching off genes. So here we have a, a new, what we call an in, a new interkingdom signaling system that, uh, that bacteria have evolved to detect plant signals, and that will tell them that, wait a minute, now I'm, I am near my plant, and I'm either going to be a beneficial interaction or a pathogenic interaction. Obviously, this makes applications a little bit more difficult, because if we go and block this signaling system, okay, we may control the pathogen, but we're also, gonna, <coughs> we're also going to affect the beneficial community of the plant. And we've done a, a lot of work on, you know, using genomics approaches, microarray and proteomics, to, to, to discover what kind of genes and what kind of systems are regulated by this interkingdom system. And I can say that for the, for the good guy, the pseudomonas, it's very important for biocontrol, it's, it's regulating antifungal uh, compounds that are made by the, by the beneficial guy. And these compounds are very important to keep fungi away from the roots. And then the bad guy, in the xanthomonas, is regulating motility. So we think that once it gets into the rice, the, 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 what, the, this is a vascular pathogen, so the, the pathogen must swim very fast to, to try and infect as quickly as possible the, the vascular system, and this plays a crucial role in, in doing so. Okay, so, so and then what, what we're, now, we're now writing a review for a very big journal because we think that this is a new system. It's very widespread. It's not confined to only pseudomonas and xanthomonas. We find this protein in a lot of bacteria, and surprise, surprise, all the bacteria that we find this protein in are plant-associated bacteria. So we don't find this in, in Escherichia coli or in, or in Shigella or in you know, you know, human-associated or animal-associated bacteria. They're all plant-associated. So he, I think we've hit a, a new uh, interkingdom signaling pathway between plants and bacteria. Finally, I will, uh, I will, I will uh, spend the next three slides, three or four slides, to, to, to to uh, illustrate to you another topic of interest that we are studying. And this, and this involves um, interspecies signaling. Now, we know I've said the bacteria living communities. That's a very important point. But the second very important <coughs> point, point that we must not forget, and students tend to forget, is that bacteria in the wild actually are not living in a monospecies scenario. You know, in, in our mouth, we have hundreds of different species living together. In the roots of plants, there are thousands of species living together. With the inside plants, there are thousands of species inside our guts. So what, 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 must, what we believe must happen, and we know very little about, is interspecies signaling. So these communities are multi-species. So how, do the, how does this take place? How does bacteria decide, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to team up with you and be a friend with you and, and make a community with you? And I, or keep you away if, you, if you're an enemy, if you, are, if you are somebody that will take most of my food away or somebody that will not cooperate with me. So I mentioned the, the interaction with the plants, and now we're also looking at this potentially new field that is very difficult to study. But what we scientists, you know, we've spent a lot of time studying signaling in a monospecies scenario, but now we have to move away from that and study how bacterial communities are formed in a multi-species scenario. And in order to study this, we, we, we came across uh, a disease, thanks to a collaborator in Morocco that contacted me. Uh, in Morocco and in all olive growing areas of the world, in the Middle East and in, Euro and in Southern Europe, Italy, Greece, and, and Spain, the olive tree uh, has this disease, this tumor, which is called the olive knot disease, which is called by a bacteria called Pseudomonas salastanoi. Okay? This is not like agrobacterium that injects its DNA in the, in the plant chromosome and causes a tumor. This actually doesn't take place here, right? This bacteria is able, it produces phytohormones and, and, creates, and, and creates a bit, the cells go a bit crazy and makes this tumor. So this Moroccan student, Moroccan group that contacted me said, well, you know, we like what you're doing in signaling, but what we, what we would like to come and study in your lab is that, in fact, in the olive knot, there is the pathogens, but we always find another bacterium. So the first, thing, uh, the first thing we did with, with Taha from Morocco is, is that we, we identified in this pathogen the, the signaling system that it has. So that this bacteria communicates with itself and, this, and, and causes the tumor only when they reach a high number. So when they're happy and they, and they proliferate in the plant, then they're going to strike and they make the tumor. And in fact, when we inactivate this language, when the, when the bacteria no longer communicates with itself, you can see that here is, these are 60 days all the olive plants which have been infected with a wild type, you see a nice tumor. And when we remove signaling, when we have put bacteria that cannot produce the signal, they're not able to make the tumor. 
So, as I was just anticipating you before, but this, this uh, tumor-causing uh, pathogen of olive, uh, it's been, uh, w when we isolate the bacteria from the olive node, we find lots of bacteria, but in most commonly we find an Erwinia, an Erwinia tolitana, just a bacteria that live ne lives near plants. Okay, that's all, you know, if we take a plant and, and we scrape off, we look, we isolate bacteria from the surface called epiphytes, we isolate a lot of different bacteria. Most of them are beneficial or harmless, and this is one of them. So we thought it was interesting. Why do we find inside the olive knot a harmless bacteria? Is there, is there something happening here? So our model of work is that, is that here we have a pathogen, which, which I would call a niche maker, because pathogens make this niche because they want to eat, they want to grow. But then we, here in the knot, we find another guy which is harmless, and it could be a non-pathogenic resident. So could there be a community between a pathogen and a non-pathogen in this, in this tumor? So we did, we did a lot of work together with Taha and collaborators in Morocco and, and, and in Italy. And what, what, I, I don't, what, I just, what I want to show here is that here we have the, the volume of the knot that is formed upon infection. And what you can see here that when we, when we infect the, the, the olive plant, one year olive plant with the pathogen here, we have a, a nice olive knot. But when we infect it with the pathogen plus the non-pathogenic, we call it resident, you can see that the olive knot is significantly bigger. So the, the, the tumor is more aggressive if we have the pathogen together with the harmless bacteria. So this is very clear evidence of cooperation. Okay? Uh, and then we, we also did some signaling studies, and what, what, what I can inform you now, that these two bacteria signal each other. So they're, they're able to, the pathogen and the, and the non-pathogenic resident are able to signal and communicate with each other. So I think here we have a, an evolutionary scenario where a pathogen is going in, is creating a disease, is creating the symptoms, and is teaming up with a non-pathogenic resident, and they will both benefit from this association. And you can see this in, in, in the next slide. We, we are now collaborating also with a group in Malaga in Spain. Here we see that these are our plant-led experiments. Uh, one of my PhD students from Brazil went to spend two months in Malaga to do these experiments. And, uh, and uh, you can see here that when we infect the, the plantlet with, with, with the pathogen, we have the, we have the tumor being formed. When we infect just with the, with the resident, non-pathogenic resident, we don't. And the pathogen is labeled in green, fluorescent, autofluorescence, and the, and the resident in red. Whereas when, when we co-infect with both, what is very important is that we form the tumor, but the, and, and when we localize, the pathogen and the harmless resident, they co-localize. So we always see the resident in close association with the pathogen. So they form a nice team together. And the, and the non-pathogenic resident really needs the, uh, the pathogens to, to colonize, to, to grow inside the, the tumor. And now we're discovering what, what is happening at the, at the, you know, at the molecular and, and biochemical level. Why, how, how does this association take place? We've just now recently also sequenced the genome of, this path, of the resident. The pathogen is, we, we know the genome sequence. We didn't know of the resident, so we, I'm happy to, to, to say we've done this now. So we have the, the whole genome. We have complete information of the genes of, of, this, of, this, of this resident. And now through, uh, through uh, informatics and, and chemical, biochemical studies and molecular studies, we want to find out how this community benefits from each other, from the two, from the two components. And my last slide is, to, to, to summarize, we've just, myself and Danielle, we've written a, a, an opinion paper for trends in microbiology, which has been published just a few weeks ago. And what we've read in the literature of several couple of science papers last year is a new concept, which is worrying in, in terms of, of uh, uh, bacteriology, inf or infection in bacteriology, is that, in fact, w what we're seeing is happening in, with bacteria, viruses, and nematodes that infect a host so an incoming pathogen, actually team up and collaborate with, with the resident bacteria. So we have bacteria inside us which are good, and they do good things for us. You know, they induce the immune system or they provide proteins. But when the pathogen comes in, they can actually team up. And they can undergo things like metabolic exchange. They can undergo chemical signaling. They can help the, the, the incoming pathogen evade the immune response. Or they can just have synergy, so they, they team up together. You know, they create a, a, a more complete, they have bigger gene pool, and they are able to to, 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 to make the disease worse. And also, what, what, is, what is also uh, you know, anticipated is a commensal to pathogen switch, that some good bacteria, which are, which are harmless and non-pathogenic, could become pathogenic with the help 
of, of, on a, of an incoming pathogen. So that's also a, a worrying, a worrying cause. So just to, like to introduce this new topic that we're looking at of this uh, teaming up of good and bad guys in, in, in hosts. And again, like, like, uh, like Lawrence, I have to thank, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of people. I, I, put, I have a lot of collaborations because in Trieste here, we have no greenhouse. And, um, you know, I've presented only part of my work. We're also working with, with other plants like uh, mimosa and like kiwi, like uh, common bean. So I need a lot of collaborations with people who have the plant set up, plant, uh, the, the plant system and, and the greenhouses. And, uh, you know, I also have uh, PhDs and postdocs from all over the world. At the moment, I have in my lab PhDs from Colombia.